Nobody is born just an action taker or driven or persistent. You will learn to adapt to these traits and they're built in you. Knowing that, find someone that's in the thing you're trying to do, model their behavior, keep on going. Don't worry if you make mistakes because you're going to and that's okay. Hello, hello everyone. I am so excited that you're here. This is going to be a spectacular episode because I am joined by the amazing Krista Mayshaw and she is just blooming incredible. So I actually met Krista back in uh, early on this year. We were both speaking at Tony Robbins and Dean Graziosi's um, challenge, which was just incredible. And I remember walking in and um, I'm hi, by the way, I'll let you say hi before I keep rambling on. (laughs) So I remember walking in and you were sat there getting your makeup done and you were looking very glamorous, even though it actually wasn't the outfit you were wearing to speak in. You still looked incredibly glamorous. I just loved it. I was speaking first, which was just a very surreal, overwhelming, terrifying experience. And um, there was a lot of screens to look at and it's like the studio. Um, And then obviously you were speaking after me. And I remember sitting on the sofa out in the rest of the office outside the studio and watching you on this big screen talk. And I was just so blown away by your story. And it's just absolutely incredible. So I am so excited. I, uh, just for everyone listening, like I was like, I really want to get in touch with Krista. I need to get back in touch with her. And then all of a sudden, like her team contacted and said about doing like podcast interviews. And I was like, yes, because I really want to speak to her. And I really want to hear all about how she does what she does. Cause you're so incredible. So obviously you have a really long career with real estate, which we can like, I know it's not the business necessary now, but then listen to this, everyone. In five years, Krista built a coaching business from zero to 51 million in five years, which blows my mind. And I cannot wait to ask you questions about this and just find out more about how you did it because it's unbelievable. But you've got like 11, like 2X comma or two comma club thingies, like from Russell Brunson. I don't know, (laughs) just blooming amazing things. Like you've done so many incredible things and in such a short space of time, especially with that coaching, the coaching side. Um, And I also know, like, I remember when I listened to you talk uh, on the the challenge, you've had your fair share of struggles and you started your career as a teacher. So we have so much to unpick. (laughs) And I also asked, I said to my team, um, I'm interviewing Krista and um, this is, you know, this is what she's done. She She's, she made like, she did made 51 million in five years in a coaching business. What do you want to ask her? And I'd like had a series of questions and they were like, Ooh. And so they've also like added their questions onto my list. So I've got some really juicy questions that I want to ask you. Um, but first I would love to kind of go back to like talk about a bit of your story because it is so amazing. And, and I think people need to hear that bit of it all to realize like, okay, so you're doing absolutely amazingly now, but it actually didn't start there because no one starts there. So where did this all start for you? Like back when you were teaching, how did this whole, like, how did you transition out of that into the entrepreneurial world? Well, thanks for having me to you know, you did so good. I was just telling her while she was on my podcast that she went first on the Tony and Dean thing and I was so nervous and petrified and she gave me like permission to go out there and feel good about it. I feel like I did better because I got to watch Carrie and she relaxed me. She had this cool heartfelt thing and I was like, God, put her there first and I would be able to not have a heart attack because I thought I was going to. So I want to, <laughs> you don't know that, but you really, really did Aww. make a huge impact on me. So thank you for that. I can kind of tell a little bit about my backstory and that is I haven't lived at home since I was 13. Um, there was some physical abuse happening from my mother, who I'm very, very, very close to uh, now. And it, it was almost like I lived in two families growing up. I had this very loving, supportive dad and mom in many ways. And then I had a very abusive mom. And so when I turned 13, I started running away from home and ended up living on the streets for over a year. Um, and then I ended up breaking the law and getting sent to juvenile hall. And I spent a few months there. And from there, I went to um, a group home for girls uh, for a year and then to a foster home thereafter. So I haven't lived at home since I was 13. And um, when I turned 18, the foster parents, the money wasn't coming in. And so uh, they were great to me. The foster parents were awesome to me, but they said, you gotta, you gotta go, you know? So I was kind of like left to figure things out uh, at 18. And um, that's kind of how that started. And I ended up going to be a, a teacher and getting student loans and working full time and doing all that to kind of put myself through college and um, it was difficult for sure. I will say that and incorporated a lot of debt, student debt um, in that manner. 
And then I ended up becoming a teacher and um, living what I thought was a happy marriage and finding out um, my husband at the time was having an affair. Two young little girls under the age of like four-ish, four and two and a half. Um, and, you know, drained bank accounts, brand new house. And it was like, what is happening? So I, I ended up changing careers and getting into real estate and just doing really, really well, really, really fast because it was sort of a desperation mode of make or break, you know, with with the kids. My goal was to keep them in that house, to keep them safe and have happy, loving memories. And a lot of that had to do with my childhood. I was like, just, they are staying here and we are going to make this work. And so I, I did really well for 17 straight years in real estate. And then about six years ago, I decided that I wanted to, I love, like you, I had this burning desire to help people. And so I started a coaching business and now I um, coach entrepreneurs and also real estate agents. And it's been um, amazing. It's been very hard. Don't get me wrong. Your story is is so amazing. It's amazing to think of what you have made happen. And especially like, although, you know, funnily enough, I was just reading um, Dan Martel's book, Buy Back Your Time. And in it, he talks about how most entrepreneurs had some kind of struggle growing up that made them like into the personalities where you can handle chaos, you can handle the unknown, you can handle stress. So you can handle building your own business because it's like very stressful at times. (laughs) Um, So it's kind of interesting, but you obviously talked about the real estate. And I remember I was, I watched a video of you where you were sharing more on the real estate side. And when you got going, I think you said you sold like 69 houses or something in the first year. And um, you were also, you know, people asked you how you did it. And then you said that you invested in like getting yourself out there and you looked at what people were doing well in the industry. And then you looked outside of the industry of what other brands were doing really well. And you looked at like how you could like kind of take ideas. And so you started to be creative and come up with ways of doing things that other people, you know, weren't doing. And then you would do things, for example, you saw someone who was a, you know, an, you know, agent in your area doing um, like being ad- putting her advert on the bus and herself on the bus and you're like, I'll do that. But then you took it a step further and then you went and you did adverts on TV. And I, when I was listening to it, I was so inspired because I feel like we can all get out there and, and play big, but most of us are absolutely petrified to do it and to take that leap. When for, So for you back then in your first year, most people aren't doing things like that in their first year. So what gave you the guts to do it? And I, I, and also I just, I really just love that you looked at who's doing things right in this industry. And then you looked outside of your industry and you thought, who's doing things well outside my industry and how can I be creative? Because I think that right there is like the entrepreneurial magic. Like if you yeah. can do that and you can look out there like that, it's just you're going to go far. Like, I mean, obviously you really have. And I think it's so inspiring. I think it's such a powerful lesson for all of us to kind of be reminded of. But yeah, anyway, how did you like, what made you decide to just go for it and like get yourself out there like that? A couple of things. You know, Tony Robbins always says, look at what somebody's doing, right? And and emulate that. There's a book from Benjamin Hardy and Dan Sullivan, Who Not How. And I just, I know how important it is to see other people's success and quite frankly, lack thereof. Like what is everybody else doing um, that, and they're not successful, which was open houses, cold calling, door knocking, all the things. Right. And then what were people doing that really were just dominating like top 1%. And I thought, I want to do that. And so I I did, I just, I just started, I'll give you an example. So back in the day, this kind of ages me, but 21 years ago, we had like, you could have a little CD and I would put, I would do like 50 pictures on and put them on the CD, put a, a little sticker on there with my face on it. And I'd put that on the sign along with the four page colored flyer. I mean, nobody was doing anything like that. If, if anything, they may would maybe had a one page black and white flyer. They didn't do any of that stuff. And, and then I put myself, like I said, on the, on the, I, I did a commercial, I put it on the movie theaters. And then I just, I very, and I quickly was like, I have to make this work, right? I'm either going to make this work or I'm going to have to, um, go back and be a teacher. One of the things I didn't mention was that my daughter at the time when I, we, I, I had, we had just bought a brand new house. My daughter, my youngest daughter had contracted spinal meningitis and then she ended up having kidney failure and, and multiple strokes. So they had basically told me, Hey, she's not going to be doing well. So my goal was, is to, I left my teaching industry and I thought, I'm just going to, you know, I'll just kind of sell a couple houses so I can be a stay at home mom. Well, 
all during that time, very shortly was when my husband had the affair. So it, a lot was very much desperation, right? I mean, I, it was either you're going to do this or you're you're going to lose your house and you possibly might lose your kids because you have to be able to take care of them. So it was it was really out of desperation. And then, and the sad thing though was, is that I was, I felt like for so many years, I was on this like spiral. It was, I, I was like, it was, you know, and I did it that for 17 years. My best year, I, I sold 169 homes as a solo agent and it was just chaos, right? And, and so I think anybody has the ability to do anything if they, if they have a strong enough reason to, we, and then everyone, you have to know your why. And I think people think that that's like, it's just overrated or it's outplayed or it's said too much. But I mean, I had a very compelling reason, right? For a lot of reasons. And, um, and I'm very driven. I think, I think for me, it is just kind of a natural thing. Um, but, but I'm not a naturally smart person at all. Like because of the abuse, I, I had a learning disability, I, I had a central processing disorder, couldn't read until I was in fifth grade, a special education class, like the list goes on. And so I've had to just like fight, 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 fight for so many things. And I still do. Things are still hard. Like, you know, people don't tell you that to make 51 million, it costs you 25. And there's months where you lose a million dollars, literally. Like I've had months where I've lost nearly $900,000. Even right now, the economy is making it a lot harder, right? So there's con constant struggles, but it's like, I always know the outcome will be okay. I have a very firm belief in, and I, I've trained myself to do that. I've, I'm a super, like you, mindset person. Personal development for me is huge. It's had to be, right? When you are abused by a parent, there's a lot of not worthy, not good enough feeling, always trying to look for that acceptance and validation and never finding it within yourself without massive, massive mindset, co you know, coaching, uh, psych psychological help, all of it, all the time, right? Like I'm constantly constantly having to like help myself be the best version of me. And, and I do believe that mindset is more important than skill set. Again, something that people say is overrated, but I know that everything that I think about, that the things that I'm thinking about, right, my philosophies, my beliefs, all of that, 1000% turns into my actions, my rituals, my routines, my habits, and that creates my outcome, my life, and everything, you know, thereafter. One of the things I think also is that you obviously invested a lot in yourself, like over wow. a million. But the yeah. point is that you don't have to have a million to invest to make progress. Like you, it's just even small amounts that people can invest to help develop. Cause like, I have always tried to shortcut things for myself. Like I remember before I even got going with the Female Entrepreneur Association, I joined a mastermind and it was like 500 pounds a month, which was so much money. And I was like, oh, I'm not making any money right now. Like, but I knew I had to show up and learn from people who were a few steps ahead of me. And they were like, we well, need to build an email list. I was like, what's an email list? So there's like, if you don't put yourself in those groups, in those circles and, and, and surround yourself with those people, then it's going to take you blooming forever. You're going to just keep going around in circles. So I do feel like it's so important for people to like, invest in themselves, invest in that knowledge so that they can grow. When you go to college, you have to invest f not just the money, but the time, four or five years. And, you know, there's, there's a study about the most prestigious colleges, Cornell and Harvard and all, and Stanford and what it costs, which is close to $170,000. The average person gets out of there making around after 12 years, the average person that goes to those prestigious colleges makes around 80. That's average. It's just, I mean, it, it's unbelievable what you can accomplish as an entrepreneur. And it took me 14 years to hit the million dollar mark as a real estate agent, right? Million dollar a year mark. Took me 11 months in the entrepreneurial space. And we, we done uh, on average 1.4 million a month the past like 33 months in a row. Um, even with, even with everything going on right now, it's definitely the it's weird the past 60 days. We've had like the hardest time. We're like, what's going on? You know, cause especially I, a lot of my business is real estate agents. And then, you know, they're the, the, where we live, interest rates have doubled. There's not as much inventory. I mean, it's like the sky is falling right on top of everything else. But, um, but you know, it's, it, I will tell you, like, I think sometimes people think, well, Kristen and Carrie are just telling people to invest because they're coaches. Right. And it's like, I can't be further from the truth. I mean, there's, investing in your knowledge and your skill and being the best version of you from somebody who's actually done the thing, right? Not, yeah. not somebody who's, what's that saying? Like for those that can't teach, then do not yeah. that type of person. Somebody, right. Yeah. Which is a lot of people careful. You're really careful of that. Yeah. But the people that have done the thing and, and that actually care about people. I mean, 
I I'm I am very similar to you and I love people. Like some people, like they say they want to help people, but half of my my manifesto is about other people. I just I was a teacher, right? I like people and I I want to help people and I I want to like you said when you were speaking at Tony and Dean's, you talked about like when you go to your deathbed and people are talking about you at your funeral, like what are they gonna say? And I want people to say, like, she helped me and she was kind and she really cared about people and she she left this planet in a better place, you know? And there's not enough of that out there, I feel like, you know, and I'm not, I like you, I love women, primarily as my, my people. And yeah, I totally agree with that. When you said you made, you made a, few, a million in, when you got into the coaching world in 11 months, like, what did you do to set yourself up for that? Like, what were some of the biggest needle movers to get you to that point? Okay. So pr- people don't tell this. They forget to tell you that to make a million in, in 11 months, it probably cost me close to a million, <laughs> right? Like initially it, it was, it was probably about two and a half years before I really became, and I know people don't want to hear that, but it's truth, right? I could have stopped. And now, like I said, we're doing way, way better than that. It took us the time, but I, I hired coaches. And so I was like sponging for knowledge. There was, I remember a time in my account where I didn't have a whole lot of money left. And I was also working two jobs. I was still working the real estate career and I was work, getting up earlier, staying up later, working on weekends to do my coaching program. I And I was using the money from real estate to help me pay for that, right? And I I just, I invested heavily again in marketing. I did what you did. I remember spending ten to $15,000 a month just putting out my video content with no call to action. Just like, I want people to know who I am. I've got to get them to know me. No one knew who I was. I was I'm, I, no one still knows who I am. I don't have like a very big list, right? Like I'm still kind of like a nobody. Out of all the people that spoke at Tony Robbins, I was the least famous person of all of them and have the smallest list of all of them, right? Um, but so I just had to invest in, in exposure. I invest in exposure. And just like you said on my podcast, you know, before we jumped on this one was that we've been taught by our mentors, he who can pay the most for exposure is going to win every time. He can, he who can market the most can win. And also, he who sticks with it long enough eventually will be successful. And those are so many things that most people aren't willing to do. But just like you, for me, the well, I am so much more afraid of like the opposite of that, like being poor forever, not making a lot of money. Like when you, I had a lot of fear around money for a long time from being in the foster home, being in the group home, not ever having enough of anything, you know? And it was like, like it was, so I, it's like, it's a thing I've had to really work on. And now I say money flows frequently and easily and in increasing quantities through multiple avenues. Like I know that even though I've had a couple months that have been rough, I know it will get better. I just have to adapt and shift. I know that things have to go down before they can go up. I know sometimes as things are going up, they still go down and that's okay. People are so afraid of that. Right. And like everything can't be great all the time. Not everything is going to work. In fact, most things are not going to. And that's okay as long as you keep trying. And I think a lot of people don't tell that to people. And because we are so used to getting everything so quickly. Right. So ping pong, Twitter, twatter, ding dong, Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, TikTok, all these things like we want everything immediately. And that's just not really how it, it works. Right. Even in what I, of my career now, people will say, oh my gosh, your, your coaching went off so fast. I was a realtor for, now it's been like 22 years, but for 17 solid years in the top 1% as an agent, working my tail to the bone. And those are the skills that I took to the coaching business originally, which helped me stand out. It wasn't that all of a sudden I was this great coach, right? Yeah. I think it's really interesting. And I I like just hearing the realness and you taking everyone behind the scenes of, of what it took and that you actually did invest and you were spending that money to get yourself out there. And like, when, like I said this on your podcast, like how, when I started FEA in 2011, I ran my first Facebook ad. I had nothing to sell. In fact, I didn't actually create anything to sell really for the first two years, but I was running ads to create visibility. And I was spending like, I started with $5 a day, 10. It doesn't have to be lows. Like if you don't have lows to spend, then like even in my first business, when I was using Google AdWords, I put it on a credit card and I had to take the risk and back it. Like, so like, and when I was building FEA again, like, uh, it, it, it was smaller amounts, but it created an impact. So I think it is just getting started. And so many people wait to try and have it all figured out before they go and get visibility, go and get visible. And I think that is such an error. Do not go and perfectly create a product 
before you actually decide to go and create visibility. Like I see people all the time, but should I run Facebook ads when I don't have anything to sell? Uh, yes. Um, should I create a lead magnet before I have anything to sell? Um, yes. Like I, and I think so many people get it back to front and then they create this amazing thing. They've spent so much time with it and then they launch it and it completely flops. And they're like, I'm failing. I'm never going to make this work. I can't make this work. It doesn't work for me. This stuff doesn't work. And you're like, actually it does work, but let's actually unpick what's happened here and let's create a better strategy for getting you the result that you want. And I I think that, yeah, there's also, I see a lot of people slogging away on like social media and social media is great in many ways, but it is a long game. That is the long game. Ads are again, like you, yes, you pay for it, but you can get exposure like so much faster. So I, for me, like learning how to run ads learning because I couldn't I mean it wasn't didn't have anything to sell at the time I didn't have that much money so I couldn't afford to hire somebody also it was back at the start of Facebook ads I don't even know who you would have hired so I figured it out myself and it's like that was a good skill set for me to develop so that I could like actually grow the business and I know in myself that that is such a huge part of why FEA is the success it is, is because I paid to get myself out there and to get FEA out there. Um, and like we said this on your podcast, like I, there's every mastermind I've ever been in, people have consistently said that whole message you said, you have to pay like to play, <laughs> which can feel really annoying for people. Like they don't want to hear it, but it's like embrace it and just do the little bit you can to get yourself out there. But the ones that are paying for money, they're still paying, okay? Like, and, and think about this because I've, I've never even said this before, but I, it kind of hit me as you were talking. You're, you're going to pay no matter what, right? You're, gonna, you're either going to pay for ads or I did the same thing you, you've done. And quite frankly, for me, Facebook has been the number, like out of all the money we've generated, I will tell you 99% of it has come through Facebook ads, right? Like if, you, if I had to tell you the one marketing um, yes, we're on YouTube, we're on TikTok. I've tried all those things, that, but the most profits are come from Facebook. And yes, it can be expensive, but it can also be like very, very good. But you're either going to pay by paying monetarily uh, for a shorter time uh, and your resources and your energy, or you're going to pay for the rest of your life, continually being broke, continually not being able to fill the financial freedom, not being able to do what you want, working for somebody else. I mean, that is like a horrific life. It's kind of like what you said, your, your fear of, uh, of the next couple of years and staying where you were, like you, the risk just, it was, it, it outweighed, the fear was way more heavy, right? So you said, I'm going to do this. Like I felt the exact same way. I, it's like, I didn't want to, like, I was so afraid I cannot go on anymore working like a real estate agent. I was making great money. We were, I was my best year in real estate. I made $1.8 million. I brought home about 1.5 million, great money coming from a teacher, right? But and that would have been comfortable for most. I probably would be an alcoholic right now, divorced and completely miserable because I was so tired and I was so unfulfilled. I was so, so done. Right. And I should have quit earlier. And so I, my, my seat says, do it now. Like I no. will tell you one of the success traits of highly effective people, even Napoleon Hill's book is, is taking action quickly. Also surrounding yourself with a mastermind team. There's a reason why he interviewed hundreds of successful people in all different ways, and they all had the same 16 success traits, right? And they weren't born that way. Nobody is born just an action taker or driven or persistent or, or you know, they're courageous. You, you learn to adapt to these traits and they're built in you, right? So knowing that, find someone that's the thing you're trying to do, model their behavior, keep on going. You know, don't don't worry if you make mistakes because you're going to and that's OK. Look at the mistakes. That's not even mistakes. But OK, I know what not to do. You know, I that one month I lost nine hundred thousand dollars. We were on track to have like a three million dollar month. And I knew I can tell now from the data, I know based on how many people are at these events, you know, my CPA, all of it. I know this is going to be a three million dollar month. Right. Nope. We change at least one thing, one thing. We only try to change one thing every month. We optimize one thing. Even when things are going well, we still pick one thing to tweak or change or modify. So I was told from one, a great coach in, in the past to send people to a link to purchase a $24,000 high ticket program. Well, you might think that $367,000 going to that link was good. No, it wasn't. We lost over $900,000 because, because we sent them to a link and didn't do our traditional trajectory. It, we, we, we knew that we lost 900000 and so my team was like, are you mad? And I'm like, I'm not happy about it. I kind of like a couple hours, I was like, crap. 
But then I knew, I go, hey, the thing is, we know not to do that again, right? And I'll tell you what, we tried it one more time. <laughs> we tried it one more time. We didn't learn the first because we were just trying to like make it easier as far as not having as many salespeople. But we learned again, that's not the thing to do. Like we knew that our best call to action is one call to action, book a call. And I will tell you that if you're selling high ticket, anything over, you know, $5,000, sometimes we'll save in 2000 people need to talk to somebody, right? And so uh, even though the, the event is a conversion event and it's built to convert, people still want to talk to somebody. It's so interesting. So I also want to dig in, like you just mentioned your team. What does your team look like and who have been the key people on your team that have helped to drive the growth? Like, has it been your ads person? Has it been your social media? Like, who is it? Like, who has been so instrumental on your team? So originally when I first started, I just said me and one other person, right? And after it was me and she was a marketer. So she was good at doing like, I was good at understanding what a funnel does in Facebook ads. She was under, she was good at the technology part of it. And so then I started teaching her how to do Facebook ads and I would create more content, the things I felt good at. And then after a while, we were like, okay, let's hire now a full-time in-house Facebook person. All They are already experienced. I taught them my way of doing it. And then, so we just kind of started growing, um, growing that way. The most influential aspect of, of our team is our leadership team. So we've got, um, we have accountability coaches that help our students. Okay. Because it's just, just as important to get people to success once they get in. It's in fact, it's more important. It's been our marketing department. Again, it's been rather relatively small. Okay. Up until now, but I have, I have like five companies. And so they all kind of work in all five companies, if that makes sense. Um, and we've got about, let's say four main marketers that run all the, all the different businesses. And I have a full-time Facebook ads person. And we have found that no matter what, having our own in-house trained person that already comes with a lot of experience has been better than hiring any agency, right? Agencies charge anywhere from 10 to, I've hit, paid in upwards of $30,000, $40,000 a month on Facebook ads uh, on just the person, not not the ad spend, yeah. right? We, we, we do spend a significant amount. Like to make a million dollars, we're spending on average $120,000 a month just on Facebook ads. That doesn't include the rest of my my, my team. And we're noticing that as we're getting bigger and making more work, the profits are getting to be a little bit less. And I've heard that, but so we're trying to kind of help with artificial intelligence and things like that. How do we kind of get more profitable? Um, and we, for a while, we were offering between a 63 and 67% profit margin. And now that's definitely been different just the past few months. But again, we know it's temporary, right? Yeah. I do really like the fact that you have acknowledged that it is difficult because I know that so many people are having a hard time. Like, I mean, even, you know, I think it's, you know, we've been on this, uh, this up and up in, over the past 10 years and now we're not, we're on the downside, you know, the economy, the wars, the political, the weird political environment that we live in. Like there's so much, there's so much stuff, uncertainty, there's just so much going on and it has changed, it has impacted and um, like I felt, I think people feel like you have to try two to four times, maybe five times harder to get the same, to even barely even get the same result. A lot of people are experiencing that or their launch is not going the way. And, and But I think that it's a time to, like you said, it won't last forever. And I think it's in these moments where we can dig deep and be our most creative entrepreneurial selves to like look at how how do we shake things up? How do we how do we kind of trailblaze this? And I I get really excited for that because sometimes you can get comfortable with things being good, and then when you get comfortable, you get complacent, and then ugh, it can just not be so great. And I think I know I know hard times are frustrating, but um, and everything it doesn't last forever, right? Like Tony Robbins, he says we're winter right now. Well, after winter comes spring, right? So. I mean, so it's, it, it's, it's ring, you know, it's, it's, we, it will get better, right? Things will get, will get better. And I always just tell myself right now, people need more help than they ever have, right? People, yes, they are in, 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 in uncertainty, but they still have bills to pay. They still have mortgages. They still have car payments. They still have, they still have all these things. So they still need a way. And if you've got that solution, it's your fiduciary obligation to help them get there because I believe there's no one better than me. You, you know, there's no one better than you for your, the people that you serve, right? Because we, we are experts. We do care. You know, I just remind myself of that. And I just know I need to adjust and also be realistic about, okay, we, there are some things you just cannot change because there are circumstances that, that are beyond our control and, and making that mental note and knowing, okay, what can we do as a company to, to still push through this, to still, to make it sure, make sure that we do outlast this shift, right? Maybe that hate your pricing. Maybe that means, you know, because again, the top of the market, they don't think they need your help. The bottom of the market can't afford your help. 
So it's like, what's that middle market that's still comfortable and profitable? How do we talk to our team about, hey, I love you. I want to keep you, but I need you to be more productive. We have to find more ways to be more efficient with our time. We can't hire more people. We've got to make this work, you know? I'm realizing sometimes that the people that got you to this point are not the same that's going to get you through or get you to the next point, right? And as a business owner, to make those decisions. It's just it's life. It's a lot, you know? Yeah. So I was going to say, you've got five companies. Like, what does a typical day in your life look like? Well, it's way easier now than it was. My husband, I, I work less now than I ever have because when I was a real estate agent, you know, I, I averaged 135 homes a year all those years you're like a psycho person. I mean, <laughs> you just are. You're just on the phone constantly. You don't really have a life. And I did not realize how much I was working. Even though I didn't work weekends or nights, I was still on the phone constantly, like constantly. It was really pretty miserable to me, quite frankly. Um, and so now I, I'm not that way. The first two years in my business, I was really working on my business, right? Like, I mean, it was a grind because I was I was trying to make my name for myself and get myself out there. And I had to create all this content and find my voice, all the things we talked about. But now it, it's not that way. Like I stop, I don't work on the weekends unless my husband decides to work and I will because I kind of like my hobby and sort of embarrassed to admit that, but I'm kind of boring. Um, and I stop my days at around 4, 4.30. You know, I do get up every morning. I'm, I'm working out by six o'clock. That's like my six to seven, my time, no matter what. And if I don't, I, my day just doesn't go as well. I don't do it for, I do it for health reasons more than I do, you know, trying to be sexy on 52 and, you know, you know, anyways. Doesn't look as good naked as I do, right? <laughs> like, um, I do it for health and energy. Um, and and one lesson I will say that I've learned over the years, and this is really important, is that you have to really be able to self-analyze. And there was a point in my, about right when around COVID hit, where I had lost two really key people in my company, and I had to look at myself and say, you are not leading right. Like, you're not being a good leader, because if you were, you wouldn't have lost them. So I had to change the way that I was leading in my own company so that I could lead better outside of it. And it was, and also adjust 1000% what we were doing. We made a complete 360 and it, and then everything changed for the positive. Had I not done that and been willing to look at myself, um, I would probably for sure, for sure be out of business by now. So very important. How much time do you spend like working on yourself or learning and growing and making that space for yourself? Cause sometimes for me, like I found that as my business grew, I ended up managing a lot of people, which I'm actually not very good at. And yeah. then I was like, oh, I need time back to be to with for my ideas. I need time to learn and to grow and to meditate and whatnot. So and I, I, that was a real struggle for me to give myself permission to do that because I kind of felt like I wasn't working hard enough if I was doing that stuff. Um, yeah. So ha do you take that time for yourself? One thousand percent. I'm I'm kind of like a, a I love learning. I'm just like I love taking trainings, but not just taking the trainings. I like taking the trainings and learning the stuff and implementing it and like mastering it. So I'd much rather go to like a three day training on one thing, uh, or, or take a course on one thing than take than go to a you know C seventeen speakers if that makes sense because yeah. I feel like I can really dive deep. So yes, one thousand percent. In fact, I hate to admit this, but this morning I couldn't sleep. So two a.m. I got up and I was taking. I was tr doing trainings online, right? And I'm, but I, I love it and I feel good about it and it inspires me. And, and, and I, and I know that when I don't, because there have been times like you where I, I was working too much in the business and I had to pull back. But I know that that learning and learning from people who were true experts in what they were doing is what got me where I'm at. And just recently, I, I just told my team, I feel like you're listening to my, in my house or something, but I'm all, guys, I got to get back into my, my learning. I said, I, like, I feel like it's affecting us, you know, that I'm not, you know, but then my team will say, well, you know, oh, you didn't learn for everyone else. I'm like, yeah, I do. Like, I, I, and I take what they, I, I listen to people and I don't take all of their advice, but I, I do take some, some of it, you know, and especially if they're better at me in this thing. And, um, yeah, so I, I think it's, it's, it's instrumental in, in success. What would be the top things you would say to people who want to build successful online businesses or have coaching businesses? What would be the top things you would tell them to do if, you, if they really want to have that breakthrough and really, really build a successful business. So I think a lot of us are taught wrong. Okay. It's so important to build your list, but like you, I, I, this is, this is kind of a quick story, but I remember when I first got into the business, I hired this coach and she taught you how to hold summits and like it was, and to build your list. It was so much work. Like I, I wasted about six months doing videos, you know, and, and nobody would hire interviewing people. And then they wouldn't, push the content because I was, no one even knew who I was. And so I was like, I'm just going to face I picked up more 
leads in one weekend and six months and all the money and time and energy and help that it took me to do that summit, right? <laughs> so I was like, that was a big mistake. I think so many people spend time doing things that aren't actually giving them a return and they're just overcomplicating it and making it very difficult for themselves. So what did you realize was the better way? <laughs> well, because I had been running Facebook ads in my real estate business. And I was like, well, I can do this in real estate. I can do it in this, right? So I just started running ads and I was like, that was the worst advice. And even people will tell you, Dean Grazi OC says, the worst advice you can get is bad advice. Not only is it the worst advice, but the, the amount of time, energy, money, and resources that I spent and wasted during that six months from getting bad advice, right? It cost me a, a lot of money. So basically you switch from focusing on trying to do this massive summit thing to just sent, doing ads to like getting your videos out there, getting your freebies out there on ads and you just direct to that. 100%, 100%. Okay, so you asked me the question like, what would I what would I make sure I did if I was selling something from the start, okay? So again, just like I did my real estate business when I looked to see, okay, what was working in the industry now? I did the same thing and I looked at, okay, what are people missing? How do I, how can I create something that is so different and unique that nobody else is creating? And I started doing that and talking about it, right? And saying things that were completely against the norm. For example, saying open houses suck and you should never do them again. Or, you know, you're told to do broker tour. Well, you know, that really doesn't work because you would call your friends and say, make sure you come to the house and leave your card so I can prove that this broker store worked. You're doing all these things because you're not adapting to what's happening right now in the world, right? You were taught to do open houses and cold call and door knock because we didn't have this cool thing called video, social media, the internet and Facebook. Let's, and so people were like hating me for a while, like, you're an idiot, they work. And so I, but that's what made my name get off there, right? And I spent several months just pushing that content and I believe that you need to ask, you need to gain permission by giving enough value and helping people enough and earning the right to ask for permission. Now it's back to what I, my, my losing my train of thought. Building, doing lead magnets is really, really important. But we are taught, do a $7 lead magnet and pay a $50 course and then do this and that. Why do you have to start there, right? Like I sell between a $25 and a $50,000 course. I've had people pay me as much as $300,000, right? Uh, to, for me and a business partner to teach them how to do something to sell high ticket. Why do you have to start here? It's, I feel like it's just as hard almost to sell a $7 program or a $2,000 program than it is to sell a $50,000 program. So I think we need to kind of retrain ourselves. And as long as you offer enough true value, you are passionate about getting a result. You, 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 you can, you can show how different you are, like not tell, show it to the world and make it impossible for them to say no to you and you get them that help that they need. Like it can be, it's so much easier than we, we make it. Now, like you said, imposter syndrome, you start worrying, like, who am I? Why will they pay? How can I help them? I first, when I first started coaching, I coached 40 people for free for about six months. I got them a result, made sure that it worked. And that built my belief and my confidence. I had the testimonials, right? And then I can go out there and say, this works. It, it didn't just work for me. It worked for other people. So sometimes things have to go down before they can go up, right? My, I didn't make a lot of money at first. I took the time to prove that it worked. I, I risked things like you did, right? And it was not always comfortable. I don't I mean, it's like a downy negative person, but I think a lot of people don't talk about that, right? If, of course, it's not always butterflies and unicorns, right? Um, and so just know that and just keep going and you will, you will be fine. Yeah. I love that. And I, I love, you've said so many amazing things. And I also love the fact that like, you really do the learning, like you've mentioned, like Napoleon Hill's book, and you've mentioned like so many people's like, you know, you've talked about other people and things you've learned. And I, I just think again, like, it's so important that we keep learning and, um, and like growing as people and you've just shared so many incredible nuggets. So thank you so blooming much. Where can people go and learn more about you? How can people connect with you? Let them know. We'll put it in the show notes as well. I appreciate you so much. This has been so great, Carrie. So thank you. Thank you. So if you go, you can obviously look, look at me, for me on socials. As you go to theprovenmodel.com slash Carrie Green, we can talk to you more about um, just what our, what, our, what our whole entire business model looks like and we can help you learn how to uh, just kind of think about business a little bit differently. So I appreciate you so much. I love that. Thank you so much. It's been incredible. Everyone listening, share your comments with us. Let us know if you've got any other questions. Let us know. Like, um, yeah, I, I really hope you've enjoyed this episode. Krista, thank you so much. You're incredible. And I will see you all next time for another episode of the She Means Business Show. Bye, everyone. Bye.